Welcome back, everybody. It's Monday, March 13th. I am John Aravosis here with the Aravosis Report, here coming to you from Washington, D.C. to talk about the latest news and to shake my laptop at you. Ah, earthquake! We actually did have an earthquake a long time ago in D.C. We don't get them too often. That's just me occasionally hitting the screen. Uh, coming to you live from Washington, D.C., where we will talk today about the latest news from Ukraine. Uh, as always, let me get TikTok rolling here on my iPad. Uh, go live. Excellent. Um, and then typically we take a couple minutes just to let folks arrive from TikTok and YouTube, et cetera. So uh, chat amongst yourselves. Actually, what we do is, here we go. There we go. I got TikTok down. So I got you guys all on my computer and then TikTok's over here. Uh, but what we do is for the first couple minutes, you guys introduce yourselves, say where you are from. And that way it gives time for the TikTokers, the YouTubers and everybody else to arrive. So if you would do that, that would be lovely. Anyway, woo, Monday, woo, woo. Oh, man. What's going on? I'm trying to think what's a good amount of news today we will talk about. Um, I can't think what else. Hoya from Fort Myers. Hello, Hoya. I'm a Hoya, too. <laughs> oh, Heya. I thought you said Hoya. <laughs> Heya, that's funny. Hoya is, Heya just means hi in English. Hoya is the name of the Georgetown University mascot which it's crazy why it's called Hoya. But anyway, so I saw Heya and without my glasses, I, I, I read it as Hoya. Thought it was a Georgetown or what do you do? So yes, just to remind everybody, uh, America had a time change early Sunday morning. We set our clocks ahead an hour for the spring, a little bit early, obviously. Uh, so that's going to screw up the schedule with Europe, which I know doesn't happen, I think, until the end of the month. So, and the rest of you, I couldn't even tell you what happens for the rest of you. But anyway, yes. So we did we did set our clocks ahead here in America. So be aware of that. I did try to set this up though before. So hopefully I'd set the uh, the pre the preview, the announcement for these lives up on Friday so that hopefully, you know, folks know. So we'll see. Anyway, let's give it another minute, guys, and then we will dive in. We usually wait a minute or well, we wait a couple minutes at the beginning just to give the YouTubers and the TikTokers and everybody a chance to arrive. So if you're watching this on recording, feel free to zoom ahead. Hmm. I hope they stop doing daylight savings time. It's annoying. It's very annoying. You know, those of us with dogs or kids, it's even worse. I mean, this way is good with the dog, but the other way, try telling the dog, it's not really five o'clock. It's only four o'clock or waking up in the morning when she wakes me up thinking it's time to eat. Crazy. Anyway. All right, guys, let me get rolling. We've got a sufficient critical mass here. Welcome. I am John Aravosis. This is the Aravosis Report. It is my nightly show, Monday to Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, U.S., where we talk about the latest news from Ukraine. Uh, the way the show works, if anybody's new, I've got a couple different audiences. My iPad over here, are you TikTokers? Over here on my laptop, I've got YouTube and the rest of you. So if you see me kind of going back and forth, that's what that's about. Um, the way we do this is about the first half of the show, I talk uh, about the news. I walk you guys through what I think are the top stories today and why I think they matter. And then the second half of the show, I will take your guys' questions and comments. On TikTok, it's quite simple. Go to my profile and the Q&A link. Feel free to give comments there or questions. But again, comments too. I don't mind if you don't have a question and have, you know, what's your opinion on what's going on with the war? Feel free to say so. Happy to bring it up and discuss. Um, the rest of you obviously can use the comment box at the bottom. Um, I always do like to mention that I'm doing this for free. And I've been doing it for free since the war broke out and I'm doing it full time. And because I am not independently wealthy and I wish I were, but I'm not, uh, I therefore am very happy to solicit and accept your gifts. So your gifts on TikTok and your super chat, super stickers on YouTube, you guys help me pay my bills and help me keep doing this. So, and you've been very generous. So thank you in advance. You guys have been amazing. So thank you. All right. Um, oh, you know, the last little update, last little update. I swear to God, we're starting the news. We're starting the news. Um, the last little update is I have decided, I finally figured out with the help of Syndicate, our wonderful uh, soon to be married in the fall, we think, um, uh, tech guy. But in addition to doing the Saturday coffee talk on TikTok every Saturday at 10 a.m., thank you for that, Saturday at 10 a.m., um, Eastern Time US, we do just a get together, sort of a coffee hangout for the paid subscribers on TikTok. I now set it up. With, with Syndicate's help, that the paid Discord subscribers will also join our coffee talk. And for you guys, it'll be via Discord, but I'll have both going live. Uh, so check it out on Discord. You'll see it in the VIP section. You'll see this Saturday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. So you guys are now welcome. So I don't remember if it was Jingle or who was upset that I didn't include others. The Discords are included as well now. So 
There you go. All right, guys, let's start. So this is day 380 of Vladimir Putin's 10-day special military operation. Welcome. Thank you, Azimak, for that. Um, the uh, A figure that I was not aware of. So you guys know about Bakhmut. We've talked a lot about Bakhmut. If you read the news about Ukraine, you will hear a lot about Bakhmut. Bakhmut is a Ukrainian town in eastern Ukraine that the Russians have been desperate, desperate to take over. And... Um, Yeah, Daniel, sorry, Daniel, I was confusing things. Uh, my Discord, the paid subscribers on Discord do it via Patreon. So it's kind of confusing to explain, but it's via Patreon is how you become a paid member. You link it with, it's very complicated. You link it with Discord. And then on Discord, Discord will recognize if you are a paid subscriber. So yes, Daniel, it's Patreon, but it's both. <laughs> so just to make life hard. So um, Bakhmut, so Bakhmut is this uh, Ukrainian town in Eastern Ukraine. Um, more or less, uh, right here where the tip of my pen is, is more or less where Bakhmut is. It is on the front between the Russians and the Ukrainians. And the Russians have been trying, I'm seeing varying, varying numbers, but between seven months and nine months, the Russians have been trying to take this town from the Ukrainians and they still haven't succeeded. They're getting closer, but they haven't succeeded. Now, You know, if you've been watching my show a lot, uh, that we talk a lot about how Bakhmut does not matter. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, it, what I mean is it has been important to the Ukrainians because Bakhmut has been a good way for the Ukrainians to basically take down Russian troops. Thank you for that. That's one of, thank you, Inspired Woman, for the coral. One of my, you know, that's one of my faves. Um, Bakhmut has been a great way for the Ukrainians to take down the Russians. Basically, um, When you are defending in a town, you have an advantage. It is always to your disadvantage as an attacker than a defender. Because especially in a city, you've got lots of places you can hide. You can hide in buildings. You can hide in rubble. So the, the attackers who are the Russians trying to take over Bakhmut, they've got to go block by block to take over the city. And there can always be a Ukrainian hiding behind, like I said, some rubble, hiding inside a building out the window. You won't see them. So very dangerous, very hard. The typical estimate for how hard it is, so to speak, is three to one. Meaning uh, when you're defending it, you will lose three Russian troops to every one Ukrainian troop if the Ukrainians are defending. So meaning, sorry, I just said a couple of gifts came in. Thank you, Louis, for the garland and Pauly for the pause. Meaning in uh, typically, if I'm defending and you're attacking, you'll lose three troops for every one troop I lose. So you can imagine it, you're at a disadvantage. In Bakhmut, the NATO says, that Russia has lost, and we're talking killed, Russia has lost five troops to every one soldier that Ukraine has lost. In other words, every time a Ukraine, not every time, but for every Ukrainian who has died in Bakhmut defending it, five Russians have died attacking it. Those are horrible numbers. And they're the kind of numbers, considering the, the normal number is three to one. Uh, the Ukrainians, by the way, claim that it was seven to one, that the number is seven to one, seven Russians dying for each Ukrainian. So it's amazing. This is, we think, the, the top reason why Ukraine keeps fighting in Bakhmut, because so many Russians are dying, it's been to their advantage. I mean, look at it this way. Russia wants to take all of Ukraine, right? If the Ukrainians gave up Bakhmut a couple months ago, because Bakhmut doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, strategically, it just isn't that important. Thank you for the, for the, for the, for the garland there, Mr. Lopez. Um, if the Ukrainians gave it up a few months ago, those Russian troops that are fighting in Bakhmut would simply move and start fighting somewhere else. So the Ukrainians would have to fight them anyway. If you're Ukrainian, or if you're anybody, wouldn't you rather fight the Russians to, in a place that is most advantageous for you and most disadvantageous for them? Well, Bakhmut is such a place. The Ukrainians cannot do, in principle, cannot do better than Bakhmut in terms of how many Russians will die compared to how many Ukrainians. So if more Russians are going to die in Bakhmut than any other battle, you'd say if you're Ukrainian, let's keep fighting the Bakhmut battle because more Russians will die there than fighting somewhere else. So that's why we think in general, the, um, the, the, the Ukrainians have been fighting there. Now, the number I saw today that blew my mind, mind you, the Russians have been fighting seven to nine months in this crazy town, okay? The number that blew my mind, This was on Sky News from a former intelligence officer, Philip Ingraman, who I believe is probably British intelligence, and said that Russia has lost, thank you for the heart there, uh, Ethel, was that, oh, Ethel Red or was that somebody else? Nope, somebody else with the heart. There we go, L for the heart, thank you. Ethel Red for the rose. Um, 20 to 30,000 Russian troops have died 
attacking Bakhmut. 20 to 30,000 attacking a town that is a town of 60,000, 70,000 people. The town currently only has like 4,000 people in it. The town is strategically unimportant for Ukraine and strategically unimportant for Russia. And the Russians have lost 20, dead, 20 to 30,000 dead. That is insane. Now, think about this. I, I, to, no, first of all, obviously, 20 to 30,000 sounds like a lot. But if you're not military or whatever you say, but what does that mean in a war? The Afghan war, Russia invaded Afghanistan, right, you know, throughout the 1980s. And it was a debacle for them. Not, not dissimilar to what the U.S. went through, similar. Um, but the Russians, it was terrible. They lost. After 10 years, they finally pulled their troops out and went home in shame. The people rose up against them. I mean, it, it, was, it was bad. The number of Russian deaths in Afghanistan, these were deaths over 10 years that were so bad, that were so bad, right? Um, that um, the deaths were so bad that Russia had to pull out of Afghanistan and consider it a disaster. In 10 years, Russia lost 14,500 troops in Afghanistan. 14,500 in 10 years. In Bakhmut alone, in less than a year, they lost 20,000 to 30,000 men who died. I mean, th that gives you a sense of just how crazy it is the number of losses the Russians have had. Thank you, Donka Shane, for the coral. Uh, but 20, 20 to 30,000 was crazy. Um, the um, Institute for the Study of War, this was kind of funny today. So you know of the Wagner group. Actually, real quick, sorry. I was going to do a quick little, uh, actually, Alexander, thank you for that. Alexander Kukushkin, Kukushkin, Kukushkin. There we go. Thank you for the hat there, Chris. Um, Ukrainian, I'm guessing. Even Ukrainians couldn't explain it that well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. Sorry. And we do have a super chat question from Cliff. The rule on super chat questions is if people ask the super chat questions, I try to get them almost immediately because um, they're paying for the questions to support my work. So Cliff Wolf had a super chat question. First Republic Bank, Regions Bank about to collapse. Oh, another one. Uh, people blaming money to Ukraine as to collapse. We need to end this lie. I mean, I don't even know what I didn't I didn't see that lie. What I saw was this weekend, David Sachs, who is a big buddy of Elon Musk, and Sachs was complaining this weekend. I mean, in his like hysterical, hysterical meaning like ah! on Twitter about how upset he was because he was convinced. I, OK, let me step back a second. This is not well, it is related to Ukraine because they're trying to blame Ukraine. In America this weekend, we had two bank, almost two bank failures, basically. One was the Silicon Valley Bank, SV as in Victor B. You will just see it called SVB. Um, and the other, I'm forgetting, was that the First Republic Bank? It was, um, was it First Republic or another one? There was another bank anyway this weekend that uh, the US government also stepped in and took over to, to protect. Um, the Silicon Valley Bank, no big surprise, was very useful to Silicon Valley. So you had a lot of the tech bros, all these high tech guys that had either their money there, they'd invent, First Republic's the other one, thank you. Or, no, Signature is the other one. That's what I was gonna say. Signature is the second one. So is First Republic a third that they're worried about? Thank you, TikTokers. Yeah, Signature was the one this weekend we found out there was a second bank. So I did not hear about First Republic. Either way, multiple banks that the US government stepped in to protect to make sure they didn't go belly but they did go belly up they basically closed them down basically you had a run on the bank by people that had their money there and banks typically don't have again way over my head in terms of economics but banks don't hold on to your money they invest it they loan it to other people right it, it, it's it's like it's a wonderful life this sort of classic old american uh, christmas show where you see everyone freak out and try to go to the bank to tank their money out which is what happened during the great depression and the banks don't have enough money so the bank ends up closing down anyway the Biden administration stepped in and said don't worry federal government's going to cover everything even though even though i believe it was 90 or 95% of the money that was in that bank was not protected by the federal government. Basically, the U.S. government says that, uh, thank you for the crown there, uh, Just Me Knight. The U.S. government says that we will protect up to, to, up to $250,000 per account, per bank account. So if you have more than $250,000, you've got to set up a second bank account, right? Well, I think it was 90 or 95% of the people in this bank didn't care. 
and they just put all their money in, even knowing it wouldn't be protected, right? Well, Biden stepped in. Oh, thank you for the fireworks there. That's very cool, Leanne. Thank you for that. And it's a very nice one, I know, too. Thank you. Biden stepped in this weekend and said, even though officially your, your deposits aren't covered, I'm going to cover you anyway. Well, over the weekend, the, the, the Elon bros of David Sachs, among others, started weighing in and claiming, you know, Biden can can give all this money to Ukraine, but what about giving money to Americans whose banks have gone belly up and trying to somehow link it to Ukraine? And we're all going, what's this with Ukraine? Um, what's funny to me is that, now I didn't see that they were literally saying Ukraine caused the collapse. What I saw was people like David Sachs saying, you give money to Ukrainians, but not to Americans. What's interesting to me is people like Sachs, Sachs, um, Kind of a hateful Twitter feed, to be honest. I find his Twitter feed very hateful. Um, it's very Elon Musk. It's worse than Elon Musk. It's very Donald Trump, I would say, or Donald Trump Jr. A lot of David Sachs' Twitter feed, and he's a top guy at Twitter as well with Musk. It's very angry. He's a venture capital guy, one of these rich. Um, I believe he's part of the PayPal mafia, one of the original PayPal guys. So he's part of the Elon Musk group of rich guys in Silicon Valley. And, you know, it tells you who these guys are that they would spend the weekend freaking out that Biden wouldn't protect their bank deposits because they're Republicans, because they're rich Silicon Valley guys. And a lot of the rich Silicon Valley guys are Republicans. It's just interesting because I'm looking at this this weekend and I knew Biden was going to cover them. I knew Biden was going to cover it because Democrats don't do that. I mean, I mean, hopefully Republicans don't either. But a Democratic president is absolutely going to care about the survival of the country. And he's going to say or she is going to say, look, we need to protect the banks. We need to protect consumer confidence in their bank or we're going to have more bank runs around the country. So no matter what, anybody who deposited their money in that bank has to get their money out. There's no choice. But this guy was so worried, this Elon Musk buddy, was so worried that Biden and Democrats were going to not give him his money or, or somebody. He didn't say his money. We all were wondering if he had money. But we're not going to give his friends their money because they were Republicans and we didn't want to help them and all this kind of crazy stuff. And to me, to me, that speaks volumes as to who these people are. They were worried that Democrats were going to screw them and not even help them out with their bank deposits because they're Republicans, I worry because that's the way they think. Like, I would have never even thought that. I would have never, thank you, Jessica. I would have never even thought, oh boy, what if, you know, if, what if we don't help them out because they're, they're, they're because of their politics? I would never think that. They think it because it's the way they think. Oh yeah, final little point Kevin Hill's noting is, we're going to get to Ukraine now again. I don't want to spend all this on the bank, but somebody did bring it up. The the people running the bank gave themselves their bonuses before they closed up the bank on Friday. They gave themselves bonuses. They made sure all their money went to themselves before they closed down the bank. That's how, I mean, these people, in any case, all right, let's go back to Ukraine. Let's go back to Ukraine. Um, Institute for the study of war that always, I get, I get a chuckle out of They're very good. I get a chuckle out of them sometimes. ISW is an excellent think tank in Washington, DC, uh, covering defense, overall, and they cover Ukraine as well. And they've been, um, they actually did a special update last night that it was so big, I, I just couldn't summarize it all for you all. But uh, thank you, Carlos. I couldn't summarize it all, but basically reiterating the fact that Putin is pretty much trying to des destroy this Russian billionaire Prigozhin. Prigozhin, you may recall, is the big oligarch, as it's called, basically these corrupt Russian billionaires who um, runs the Wagner Group. The Wagner Group is the mercenary group, the soldiers for hire that the Russians uh, are using in Ukraine, but also use around the world. Well, uh, he also, Americans will know, he also is the guy that created and runs the Internet Research Agency, which is the Russian organization that tried to interfere among other Russian organizations in the American election um, in 2016 Now and beyond. So Prigozhin has been getting very full of himself. He runs a mercenary group. He had, you know, 50,000 men or whatever it was in Ukraine. And his big, you know, his big bravado was, hey, the Russian military sucks. I'm much better. I've got a private army that's much better. Than, it's so much better than the Russian army. People pay us to defend them. And he kept knocking Russia and he kept knocking the Russian military and implicitly knocking Putin, right? Now, the war, we all know the war hasn't been going well for the Russians. But if you're Russian... You, you better be careful saying that publicly. And he keeps complaining publicly. And again, 
Whose fault is it? In the end, it's Putin's fault if the war is not going. So anyway, it, it's been very clear, and I've been saying it for months as well. It's been very clear that this guy is kind of making a, a push against Putin, right? That he's basically, I think he wants Putin's job. Well, Putin finally figured it out. And an Institute for Study of War did a whole long analysis about it today. But bottom line, it they think, they think that that Putin is basically trying to kill all of this guy's troops, that he's trying to kill Putin himself. Uh, thank you for that. Was that the coral? Thank you, Iggy Woman, for the coral. That Putin himself is trying to kill the Wagner mercenary groups, which are Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine, um, because he's trying to destroy Prigozhin. And Prigozhin's strength is his army. So if you kill Prigozhin's army, you've killed Prigozhin's strength, right? Um, it's long story short. The Russians have been cutting off ammunition to to the uh, to the to the to the Wagner people, which is again hilarious. Thank you, Ali, for the Lucy the Llama. Um, they're not giving them enough ammunition. Um, they're they're <laughs> Putin apparently is throwing more and more of the Wagner troops against the Ukrainians in Bakhmut to the point where I read today in ISW that they're taking Wagner mercenaries from like Crimea, basically people that that Prigozhin had spread around other occupied parts of Ukraine, and they're taking all of them and sending them to Bakhmut to be killed. <laughs> I mean, it's really kind of amazing. It's absolutely kind of amazing. Um, I love it. I mean, I, I love it because you are you are seeing a civil war within the Russian military. You know, you're seeing ego politics at the top of Russia, right? From Putin versus Prigozhin. And you're seeing both men let it influence how they're fighting the war in Ukraine, which is idiotic right? Because you should be fighting this war to win. You shouldn't be fighting the war and saying, hey, let's make our strategic decision about this town of Bakhmut based on how much it hurts my political enemy. That's just insane. Um, any case, makes me laugh. Thank you, D, for the confetti. We did have another super chat question here from Will Rawlings. Hey, Will, thank you for that. If Russia pulls out, do you think that Putin loses his grip on power, possible military coup or citizens revolt? Um, I, you know, who knows? I, I say that because at this point, Putin has a very good grip on power and he's been, you know, he's been there for 20 years, right? So he knows what he's doing and nobody really thinks Putin's in danger right now. Now, I think if you're, if you're Putin and you're trying to figure out what, if you're Putin and you're only worried about your own survival, you kind of have to say, okay, if I stay and keep fighting, but we're stuck for five or 10 years, does that help me? Or if I cut my losses and say, you know what? We did the best we could. Let's get the hell out of here. Does that help me more? Thank you, Crusher, for that. Like which one, which one helps you more in terms of not pissing off the Russian people, not pissing off the power centers in Russia, right? So you're talking like, you know, the secret police, all of those guys. There's a lot of other sort of power centers, the intelligence community, um, a lot of the military, obviously. Thank you, Music for for the confetti. Um, so you're kind of trying to figure out which one gets me into more trouble, right? Afghanistan for 10 years helped bring down the Russian government, helped bring down the Soviet government. But but if Putin quits too soon, it doesn't mean he's a loser and a failure, which also, um, from some reading I'd done previously, the Russian people are not very, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Thank you, Don Shane, for the coral. Um, Russia has a history of basically turning on their government when they have military losses. Okay. So it, there, that's one of the lessons that Putin has to worry about is if I declare, well, he wouldn't declare that he lost, but, but he would declare we won, right? We de, we de -NZ fied Ukraine, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, but the point is the people would know that, 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 that they lost. So the question becomes, is that, is that a bigger deal that upsets them more than dragging this out for a couple of years? I don't know. I mean, I, you would hope that Putin would be in more trouble as the war goes on. Either way, he should be in more trouble, but he's a dictator, you know, unless you have a popular uprising or again, the top people around him rise up. But I don't know. I'm not, I'm not very confident that anything's going to happen to shake him anytime soon, but you know, we can, we can hope in principle. Um, let me look here. You know, I'm going to do a quick explanation for my discord, and then we're going to talk about the International Criminal Court. There was a lot of really interesting news today, actually. Um, so real quick, I've got a discord community set up. It's another way to uh, support my work, but also 
hang out, really. We A lot of us hang out together. We chat there about Ukraine, but lots of other topics, including fun stuff too, like our pets, recipes, you name it, Iran, serious stuff. In any case, you can check it out at discord.erevosis.com. Uh, you guys can find the link in my uh, right there, erevosis.com on the screen. You guys can go to my profile on TikTok. It's my link of links where it takes you and you can see all my links. But the um, Discord's kind of fun too because we have auctions and I auction off a lot of cool Ukrainian stuff that half of the money goes to support my work and half of the money goes to support Ukraine. We channel it back into Ukraine. But again, I do this for free. Uh, I do it full time. So I'm trying to find ways to pay so I can keep doing it. And that's one of the ways we do it. Um, oh, thank you, user, for the cap there. Um, just to show you really quick, one of the newest things we're auctioning off just for fun, but I got these... Um, a little, little reflective, but these Ukrainian uh, refrigerator magnets from the Ukrainian post office. I bought them from the Ukrainian Postal Service. They arrived today and they're uh, commemorating the stamp the Ukrainians did for the Russian warship Go F Yourself episode. Remember how the Ukrainians, um, the Moskva, which I'll show you really quick. So the Moskva was that ship, the big Russian flagship in the South. And um, thank you, Ju uh, Juju, for that was the big Russian flagship in the South. And it's the ship that came up to Snake Island and told the Ukrainian troops early on in the war, thank you, Benji, for that, that told the Ukrainian troops early on in the war that, you know, Ukrainian troops surrender or we will kill you. And the Ukrainian soldiers said, and we've got the audio, you know, Russian warship, go F yourself. But they didn't say F. They said in in Ukrainian, what was it? I think, um, you know, go, go F yourself. And it became super famous, right? Well, just to add to the humor of it, that happens to be the same ship that the that the Ukrainians sunk a few months later. Remember, they they developed their own cruise missile torpedo Neptune, whatever you want to call it, but this Neptune, you know, thing that they shot at it and did brilliantly. By the way, took the ship down. Anyway, so there's a lot of they did a stamp commemorating it, and this is a um, fridge magnet based on the stamp. So you can see, anyway, it's kind of cool, but I've got a lot of fun stuff like that we're auctioning off. Um, let's go back. So that's discord.erevosis.com. Oh, and again, you can pay for the Discord and then you become a VIP member and you've got different auctions. You can support my, my um, Americans love fridge magnets. Are you kidding? Oh my God. Sorry, Alexander in Ukraine is asking if Americans like fridge magnets. <laughs> oh yeah. Doesn't everybody? I mean, is that not a thing around the world? I would think. In the U.S., it's definitely a thing. I, I just assumed it was a thing around the world, but we definitely like them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody, people on TikTok are going, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love them. I've always loved them. All right. So the International Criminal Court, um, there were a couple different stories today, each one sort of adding on to each other. But the International Criminal Court uh, in The Hague, which is investigating uh, the war crimes allegations against Russia, and... Um, the New York Times reported today that the ICC is going to open two war crimes cases against Russia, one dealing with the children that Russia kidnapped, Ukrainian children, and took back to Russia to be, or to be, to be, uh, I was going to say auctioned, auctioned kind of is the word, to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for, adopted by Russian parents. They just stole Ukrainian kids. The second case is the, um, the second case is, Russia's never-ending attacks on civilians in Ukraine, which is also war crime. You're not allowed to intentionally attack civilians and that's or civilian infrastructure going after the electricity, right? Going after uh, apartment buildings is really bad because apartment buildings, they're literally trying to kill Ukrainians. Um, that's a crime as well, a war crime. Now, what uh, Reuters jumped in and reported as well, all the news then jumped, you know, it's nice because you get all the reporters kind of jumping in and adding more to each other's story. So Reuters jumped in and said, the International Criminal Court is expected to seek arrest warrants against Russians over the war in Ukraine in the short term. Now, that means that the ICC thinks they have enough information to actually put out arrest warrants against Russians. It is possible these arrest warrants could go as high as uh, Putin. Now, the one problem here is that the International Criminal Court uh, does not do trials in absentia, meaning if they cannot get physical jurisdiction on the person, if they can't arrest the person themselves, they will not hold a trial. So they will not hold a trial of Putin or somebody else if they can't actually get their hands on Putin. So that's the, that's the bad thing, you know? Um, but nonetheless, 
that's really good news because one of the concerns we had about war crimes is it can take 20 years or forever to develop enough evidence to actually prosecute. This means that they think they've got enough evidence already to at least launch two big cases, which is great. Um, anyway, so that's good news. The um, deet, 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 deet. Reuters. Oh, yeah. So Chinese President Xi is planning to go to Russia for a meeting with Putin as early as next week, Reuters is reporting. Uh, Xi will then, after the meeting, uh, talk with President Zelensky by video, which is interesting considering, you know, we've been trying to sort of follow what's going on with all of that. You know, we'll see. I mean, it's 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 never a bad thing that Zelensky's talking to the Chinese because maybe it it maybe it will somehow get the Chinese one step away from you know from giving Russia weapons which we've been worried about them possibly thinking of doing soon. Uh CF Gregory, oops, sorry my eye is itching. Um Riga Central train station is going to remove the Russian word for terminal and left the Latvian and English up oh they did and up last week. Oh that's funny. Oh that's funny. Oh, that's great. Well, see, this is th what's interesting about that. Okay, so basically, you had the train terminal in Latvia, and it had um, right Latvia. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna screw this up. It better be Latvia. Oh, Latvia. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say I better get this town, the the country right. You've got Latvia, which is you know one of the Balkans, uh, Baltics. Excuse me, one of the Baltic countries, uh, formerly part of the Soviet Union because the Russians invaded them and took them over. Um, but Latvia had up at their train station the word for terminal, you know, train terminal or station in English, Latvian, and Russian because they got a lot of business. For all of those, they took the Russian word away. Obviously, it's a small thing. But what's interesting is it goes to the cultural changes we're seeing. You know, Russia complains a lot about, you know, Russophobia. They created this word to describe, basically to exonerate themselves from all the bad publicity they're getting because they're committing genocide in Ukraine. And they call it Russophobia. Basically, uh, they're intentionally bastardizing the word homophobia because the Russian government is incredibly homophobic. And they're intentionally twisting the word by saying you're Russophobic by basically any kind of criticism of Russia, right? Well, the issue for them is though, I don't know that they fully appreciate how much they have turned, how much they've hurt themselves culturally in so much of the world, right? For Americans, at least for people on the, for Democrats and for, I think, normal Republicans, maybe the MAGA Republicans, who knows? But for normal Republicans, um, Russia has gone back to becoming the Soviet Union again. I think all of us look at it and go, those are the same, those are the same people we had to deal with 30 years ago and that America had to fight for decades. And Europe had, and Europe not only had to fight for def decades, but half of Europe was occupied by the Russians for decades, right? They, they, the Russians occupied half of Europe and installed communist, brutal communist dictatorships in that half of Europe. So, but, but it's interesting to me. And then you look at Ukraine as well, and you see the Ukrainians talk about how, um, you know, Russia was one of the, uh, uh, one of the sort of languages of Ukraine, Russian. Eastern Ukraine speaks Russian. Uh, my friend Vlad, who we've had on the show before and um, is basically our contact in Ukraine for all the, all the charity work we do, Vlad uh, grew up in Kharkiv and grew up speaking Russian. He did not know Ukrainian, he said, until he was, I think, 10 years old. And he had to start learning Ukrainian because his high school exams were going to be in Ukrainian. So he had, because the country is Ukraine, he had to learn the language for his high school exams because his, his family spoke Russian. Now, they did not think of themselves as Russians. They thought of themselves as Ukrainians. But like any country, you know, uh, Belgium, right, having two languages, you know, uh, well, three, I guess, really. Oh, no, two, right? You've got, uh, you know, a French and was it, I always say, is it Flamand or whatever you call it? But, um, you know, kind of the Dutch, the Dutch version of, uh, of, the, of the language and the French. Um, Canada, p these people do not, the Quebecois in, in, in Canada, I'm not going to speak for them, but from what I know, they don't perceive themselves as French, meaning they don't, they don't think I'm from France, right? They think they're Canadian. Now, they may not like the, the, the English Canadians. <laughs> they may not feel some of them like they're one country, but they don't feel like, oh, you know, they're English Canadians and we're actually French, like we're from Paris or something and we want to join France. No, Ukraine's the same way. Just because they speak the same language. There are, there are lots of countries out there that have multiple languages that people actually speak as their first language. And it doesn't mean they want to be part of the other country. Anyway, 
Um, I forgot why we were mentioning that. Um, I don't know why we were mentioning that. Oh, about your question about English being removed. Yeah. So what the Ukrainians are now doing, a lot of the Russian speaking Ukrainians, they no longer want to speak Russian. And they've literally, I mean, I think Yulia is in the chat with us right now. She can sort of, she can tell you guys in the, uh, in the comments that you see a lot of Ukrainians who, who grew up speaking Russian, who now, Vlad tells us the same thing. They've tried to switch to Ukrainian with their kids because they don't want to, or with their friends, because they don't want to speak Russian anymore. So that's the cultural impact Russia's got to deal with. I mean, the other thing Russia talks about a lot is, oh, we're being canceled. Russia's being canceled. You know, Russia is being canceled. I mean, that is, they brought it on themselves. They've created a culture in which people no longer want to, uh, you know, associate themselves with that country. It's, it's not, those things are really hard to gauge out over the long term. Um, the Academy Awards. So last night, the documentary Navalny, um, about the uh, poisoning and detention of jailed Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny won the Oscar for Best Feature Documentary. Um, I have not seen it. I want to see it. It's supposed to be very good. CNN was one of the parties behind it. I forget who else. Um, what's interesting with Navalny is that a lot of Ukrainians are not thrilled with the man. Um, he is a Russian opposition leader. He is in solitary confinement. Um, he's not in good shape. And Putin can't stand the guy, of course. Thank you, Jay Ticker, for the hat and mustache. Um, a, a lot of Americans like him because they look at him as the opposition to Putin. Oh, it's on the BBC. Oh, Deborah Sunwell says it's on the BBC tonight. Oh, very cool. Um, I'm hoping, I've got to look for when it's on in the States again because I just didn't see it. You know, the Ukrainians will tell you, I mean, they're not wrong, that Navalny, exactly, that Navalny isn't exactly pro-Ukrainian. I believe Navalny uh, defended the occupation of Ukraine and that he is still, they will say, a Russian nationalist. Now, I, I will say I just don't know enough about it, you know, so I'm not going to sort of defend either side in this. Um, I will say one thing. Thank you. Um, who was that? Hat and mustache. Thank you, music, for the hat and mustache. Um, I am not a typical guy for the folks I hang out with in Washington or nationwide, um, a lot of folks in politics, at least on the left, kind of believe that you should sorry, my shirts. I'm looking at my shirt. It's driving me nuts in here. It's like a little crooked, but because it's mirror image, I'm going to get it wrong. Um, I respect the Ukrainian point of view, but I want to know more about it because it doesn't make it correct just because the Ukrainians are saying it. That's my only point. And I'm not trying to knock the Ukrainians here. But I've, I've, on this issue in particular, a lot of folks online have been trying to like shut down anybody who disagrees, including Ambassador McFall, who was a U.S. ambassador to, U to Russia, who's a very smart guy, and a lot of other very smart people who say, you know, the guy's got issues, but this is still very helpful what he's doing against, against Putin. Um, any case, I, I need to look into it more... I understand where I understand absolutely why the Ukrainians are coming from where they're coming from, but I also understand why the Russia experts would say, yeah, but for Russia, this is still pretty good. <laughs> you know, for Russia, for Russia, what he's doing is very helpful, even if he also is a nationalist. That's all I'm saying. In any case, let's move on. Um, the Fisher. So Politico had an article today. It was kind of a nothing article. Politico is a very good. American publication, by the way, American politics publication based here in Washington, D.C. And they had an article today about fissures between you know, like cleavages, you know, uh, division between America and Ukraine. And I don't think it did a very good job explaining it, um, but, but meaning I don't know that it presented a very good case saying there's like growing differences. They tried to argue things like, you know, that Biden or our, our defense secretary has disagreed with Zelensky and whether the Ukrainians should keep fighting in Bakhmut. And I'm like, yeah, so what? I mean, give me a break, you know? Okay, yeah, I'm sure our military probably told him, look, now it's time to sort of cut and get out of there. And Zelensky said, no, 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 no. You know, we need to keep fighting. That's not, I mean, <laughs> the guy's not our puppet. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay for the Ukrainians to say, on this one, America, we disagree. We're going to keep fighting in Bakhmut for a little longer. I mean, I think of, I think of, for example, now I'm saying like, I think Politico was playing games a little bit with this story, trying to present it as being, oh, you know, um, a big, a big division between Ukraine and America. Um, the, I think of the beginning of the war, the U.S. offered to get Zelensky out of there, right? 
And remember Zelensky famously said, what, I, I need weapons, I don't need a ride, or I don't need a ride, I need ammo or whatever, ammunition. And that you could look at that as a fisher, right? America wanted him, thought it's best for you to leave. And he said, no, 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 I'm going to fight. And in the end, Zelensky was right. Fighting actually made sense in that case, even though we thought they were going to lose. The fighting made sense. So I could see somebody like Zelensky saying, look, you got it wrong at the beginning of the war. You thought we were going to get killed and we didn't. You wanted me to leave. I didn't. I made the right decision. You made the wrong decision. That's okay. Right? That's okay. But in this case, maybe it's the same thing. Maybe Zelensky's military knows better what to do about, about what's going on in Bakhmut. So it kind of bugged me. Now, the one thing I did see, which was interesting, the Republican chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, so the House committee that deals with uh, international relations, had a quote, and I really agree with him on this. I, I, let me say one other thing, too. A, I agree with him. B, I think this is very helpful, what he's saying, even though he's critical of Biden. He's critical of Biden because he wants more to be done for Ukraine. And that's very helpful for Ukraine to have a House Republican and the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, who's one of the top House Republicans, period. On inter he's, he'd be the top guy on international relations, basically being very pro-Ukraine, pro-the war is very helpful. Listen to this. The, the Biden administration doesn't have a clear policy objective and a clear goal. Is it to drag this thing out, which is precisely what Vladimir Putin wants? Um, is it just to give them enough to survive and not to win? I don't see a policy for victory right now. And if we don't have that, then what are we doing? Th I mean, this guy is channeling me. I have been saying from the beginning, again, yeah, yeah, yeah. Biden's done amazing stuff. I get it. We let's, as we say in the law, I stipulate that Biden has done an amazing job. That's great. What's the plan? How do we plan on win? Do we even want Ukraine to win? He's not going to say. Do we want Ukraine to get all of its territory back? I don't know. Do we want Ukraine to get Crimea back? Ho, ho, ho. I can pretty much guarantee you the answer to that is no. Um, so what's the plan? What's our timetable? I don't think we have one and I don't think we know what the plan is. I think literally, I, I really do. I think we just keep slowly giving more weapons, but we're doing it so slowly that we're not giving Ukraine enough weapons to do a knockout, to basically do sort of a knockout punch against the Russians. So it's very slow and gradual, which means the war drags on and the war is going to keep dragging on. And the longer the war drags on, it, as this guy said, it helps Vladimir Putin. It doesn't help Ukraine because in the end, Putin's a dictator. He can stay there as long as he wants, even though he's losing men, he's losing equipment, he can still stay. No one's going to force him to come out, right? In a democracy, we've got a lot of people who could stand up and go, you know what? We've been fighting this war for three years. It's costing a lot of money enough already. So I, anyway, I agree with this guy a lot on this. Um, British Ministry of Defense. Oh, this was interesting. So this was the British Ministry of Defense today, weighing in on the Wagner mercenary group that we talked about earlier, recruiting high school children. Now, let me read you this really quick from them and we can talk briefly about it. In recent weeks, the Wagner Group owner, Prigozhin, has likely lost access to recruiting in Russian prisons due to his ongoing disputes with the Russian Ministry of Defense leadership. Prigozhin is highly likely pivoting recruitment efforts towards free Russian citizens. Since the start of March 2023, Wagner has set up outreach teams based in sports centers, meaning like workout gyms and things, in at least 40 locations across Russia. In recent days, masked Wagner recruiters also gave career talks in Moscow high schools, distributing questionnaires entitled Application of a Young Warrior. Oh, God. Questionnaires. And the title of the questionnaire says Application of a Young Warrior. Um, the uh, To collect the contact details of inst interested pupils, about half of the prisoners Wagner has already deployed in Ukraine have likely become casualties, and the new initiatives are unlikely to make up for the loss of the convict recruit pipeline. If the ban endures, Prigozhin will likely be forced to reduce the scale or intensity of Wagner operations. That was That's something based on the story I told you earlier about how he's in a fight with Putin now, and basically Putin's trying to hurt him. So they're getting so desperate for troops in the Wagner group that he's trying to get basically children now, basically. Um the grain deal, Russia reportedly has agreed to extend the grain deal by another 60 days, but that's it. The grain deal is the deal that was worked out between Ukraine, the United Nations, Turkey, and Russia for Ukraine to continue exporting its grain to the world. 
Um, half of the grain, I believe, might be might be going to Europe. Half of it is going to Africa, mind you, very poor countries that are now starving again. The uh, the food crisis has kicked up again, bigger than in decades, I believe, in Africa, and going to uh, countries in Asia. And Putin was initially holding the food hostage to all of those countries and not letting Ukraine export any of it. And finally, the deal came where it was allowed to export it. Um, it's anyway. So Putin's going to they've got to renew it every once in a while. He's going to allow them to renew it for only two months. And then we'll see. Now, you'd think at some point, all these countries that are still defending Putin in Africa might kind of wonder if he's the right guy to be settled up to considering He's threatening their food. Um, Iran has agreed to buy Su-35 fighter planes from Russia, which is obviously very concerning. Um, really quick, I'll do a quick pitch for my Patreon, and then, boy, we're going long again tonight. Then uh, I will, yeah, I'm going to close with one thing. So quick pitch for my Patreon. Patreon is another, so my eyes are itching tonight. I must have allergies, I think, tonight. Uh, Patreon's another neat way of helping creators, me among others. Um, thank you for the boat there. Who was that? Uh, Carmel or Carmel for the boat. Uh, Patreon is a neat way you can help creators by basically going and making a set contribution each month to them. You know, five bucks, 10 bucks, 25 bucks a month, whatever. But on the creator side, people like me, it's nice because you know how much money's coming in each month. And as I said, for most of us, I think all of us really, no one's paying us to do this. I mean, I wish. I wish my government, I wish the CIA was paying me to do this. <laughs> it's like CIA, if you're listening. Um, but, you know, the way I get paid for doing this is you guys supporting me is with your gifts and with your, your questions on YouTube. Um, I do do it full time. I do do it for free. I've been doing it for a year. And it's, um, you know, you guys help me pay the bills and you guys help me keep doing this. So thank you for that. And uh, Patreon is another way of doing it. So patreon.com slash Aravosis. Thank you for that. Who is it? Happy Beach. Thank you. And Crusher. Um, you can find my Patreon via erevosis.com for you guys. Or actually, the link is right on the screen for you all. And for you all, go to my link in my profile on TikTok. And my Patreon's there too. But if you can help, I'd really appreciate it. Um, you know, I'll give you the last story I'll give you is um, Zelensky has posthumously conferred the highest national title, Hero of Ukraine. Thank you for the hearts there, Magic. Magical photo has uh, the national title Hero of Ukraine on a soldier captured on film smoking his last cigarette before being gunned down. You remember this. This was um, the big story last week of a Ukrainian prisoner of war apparently being held by the Russians and uh, smoking a cigarette and saying Slava Ukraini, which is, you know, uh, glory to Ukraine. Thank you, D, for the hearts there. Glory to Ukraine, which is a... a I don't even know what to say. It, it's kind of like saying God bless America, except we don't say it nearly as much as the Ukrainians do. The Ukrainians say it all the time. It's sort of their national slogan, their national uh, thing. It's just, it's a, it's something they say a lot, about, you know, so that it's not even God bless America. It's, it means much more to them, I mean, in their hearts. So he says, Slava Ukraini, and you hear a Russian say, and he's saying it in a Russian accent, a Russian say, die, bitch, he says to him in Russian, and they gunfire opens up from all sides and kills this guy on camera. It's horrible, absolutely horrible. Previously, he was identified by the wrong name. Um, when I when I told you guys last week, the Ukrainian government misidentified him. His actual name is Alexander Matsievsky, and he's the guy that Zelensky gave the highest honor to today, in honor of of obviously, you know, standing up for Ukraine. It reminds me, as an American, it reminds me of the. Is it Nathan Hale? The I regret that I have but one life to give for my country that he said before the British troops executed him during the Revolutionary War. So very when our war against the British when we you know wanted our independence. So very uh, very moving. All right, let's jump into the questions. As always, we're going long, but this is what we do. Um, so for quite, oh my God, my eyes are going to drive me nuts here. For questions on TikTok, uh, submit your questions via the Q&A link in my profile. For you guys on YouTube and elsewhere, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, let me dive right in and grab some questions from TikTok. I'll, I'll start doing questions here. Thank you, Nazar. I appreciate that. Um, oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. All right. TikTok, TikTok, TikTok. All right. Boom. Yep. There we go. There we go. Why hasn't Ukraine finished off the Crimean bridge? Well, 
it's not clear they can. Um, you know, up until now, there. Well, here's the thing. Okay, so the Crimean Bridge is this. You got Crimea. Crimea is a Ukrainian territory that Russia invaded and stole back in 2014. Okay, thank you, Big Gator Girl. Appreciate that. Russia stole it back then. Um, Russia itself starts about 12 miles off here. So you've got a little bit of an open sea here for the Black Sea, and then, you know, water in here. And then Russia starts about 12 miles away and then continues over here, over here, all over the place, right? Putin wanted a land bridge from Crimea that he stole. The rest of this is, you know, I mean, this is all Ukraine, of course, but the rest of this was still, the Russians hadn't occupied it yet. He wanted to create a land bridge to Russia. So he built a bridge, you know, this Crimean bridge, um, right across, or actually it's the Kerch Bridge, I should say, the Kerch Bridge, because the town of Kerch, K-E-R-C-H, is right here. So the Kerch Bridge going across. Well, somebody a few months ago, remember, like September, October, whenever it was, bombed the bridge. It may have been a suicide bomb. I don't know that we ever got the answer on that, partially because Russia is the one investigating. But they may have used a suicide bomber. We don't know. We think it was a suicide bomb, like a bomb or or a bomb on the guy's truck he didn't know about, which is kind of creepy. Um, the, the problem is, to date, Ukraine has not had missiles that can reach the bridge. Oh, that's what I was going to tell you. So the bridge is all the way down here. The line between the Ukrainians and the Russians for fighting is... This is the line between Ukrainian and Russian troops, more or less, okay? It's here. So everything above this, everything above this over here is, is Ukrainian controlled still. So for the Ukrainians to hit the Kerch Bridge, they've got to fire from here. That's just too far. Their, their weapons don't go that far. Um, and the reason their weapons don't go that far is we're not giving them the longer weapons. <laughs> I mean, this has been a complaint that a lot of us have had from the beginning. And by the way, that is probably part of the reason, if not the reason, that we're not giving them the longer range weapons because President Biden doesn't want the Ukrainians trying to go after Ukraine, I think. Um, but that's why. The, the other issue is people have raised the HIMARS. Now, I'm not even sure that the HIMARS can reach that part of the bridge, but even if it could, the kind of weapons, the missiles that the HIMARS shoots, I remember months ago this was being discussed, and I read some of the experts say that you would need something like 50 HIMAR strikes. You'd need like 50 different attacks on the bridge to try to take it down because the bridge is very well fortified and the, the weapon just isn't that big, the explosive power. So, you know, that would be a problem. Now, JDAMs, yes, Dark Chef is saying JDAMs could take care of the bridge. The problem with JDAMs, though, is it's got to go far enough. I'd have to see, I need like a little scale to see how far this is. You know, even the JDAMs, though, the JDAMs, which is the newest, one of the newest weapon systems that we've given to Ukraine that they've now got, where basically they can extend the range of their bombs and turn their dumb bombs into smart bombs. So they're more accurate and they're also very uh, big, right? Actually, uh, yeah, the JDAMs, the uh, the $2,000 bomb, the, I mean, $2,000, 2,000 pound bomb. The only thing is, can that reach that? Can it reach the bridge? That's the question, right? But can it reach it? From what I was reading, that's still too far. And unless that plane was able to get far enough down, but you don't want the Ukrainians to lose their plane, right? So that's an issue. Um, that's the thing. I don't think they can reach it. Thank you for the March gift there. Um, you know, uh, Jay is asking sort of the perennial question on TikTok of, do I think the Russians are going to use nukes? Um, yes, Mike, the longer range for the HIMARS, the problem with the HIMARS is we've only given them the weapons. Well, we're, we're upping. We were giving them the weapons that can go 50 to 60 miles. 100 kilometers. Now we're upping the weapon distance, I believe, to 100, or we're giving them a separate weapon that can go like 100 miles, I thought. That was announced like a month or so, a month and a half ago, but we're still not giving them the longer ones. Correct. Um, you know, the nuclear thing, the nuclear thing, I mean, we've talked about it a lot. I don't think anything has changed. I think Putin really wants you to think he's going to use nuclear weapons because people in the West are terrified of it. Europeans, understandably, because they're right there, right? If you're a neighbor or you're almost a neighbor of Ukraine, you don't want nuclear weapons used. Um, the whole idea of nuclear weapons being used also is scary because it makes you think, well, if Putin uses them, would America use? Like, it's the beginning of a nuclear war, right? So uh, Putin wants you to think that he might use nuclear weapons. I don't think there's any way he's used nuclear weapons because in the end, it doesn't make any sense militarily. The military experts have said 
it doesn't help Russia in terms of their battle. So dropping nukes here and there wouldn't help them strategically. So it's not like, it's not like, hey, we've got the big Ukrainian uh, camp of 100,000 troops. And if we drop a nuke, we kill them all. That doesn't exist, right? So you've got to, thank you, Jedamam, for the owl. So you've got a situation where um, there, the nukes don't help militarily. The nukes, oh, my helicopter, we always get our little helicopters. That may be, that may even be, you guys, you guys could see it over there. That may even be one of the president's helicopters. We usually, we get them all the, they very rarely have him. They only have him when it's three of them, but the president's helicopters are always going by. It's, it's always kind of fun, but I'll, I guarantee you that probably was one of them because they're very loud. Um, but the Putin could potentially use the nukes to try to, you know, scare Ukraine into giving up. But is Ukraine going to give up? No. Right. Ukraine's not going to give up because they got because Putin used a nuke. Knowing Ukraine, they're going to get even more pissed off if Putin used a nuke. Um, then you get India and China, two of Russia's biggest. China, certainly one of its biggest defenders. India, an important ally, not an ally in the war, but ally. India has refused to help Russia, uh, excuse me, refused to join on to the sanctions against Russia. India and China, it is thought, would freak out if Russia used nukes. And that could endanger Putin a lot too. So nobody really thinks, I'm sorry, the final point, the final point is that if he uses nukes, it is expected that NATO will respond militarily. And it's not clear what NATO will do, but it will be swift and it will be overwhelming. So that's the other situation. So no, no, it, it's still, you know, there's still that small little chance because he's got nukes, but nobody thinks that. Um, nobody thinks that he's actually, not nobody, most of us don't think he's actually going to use it. Um, what did Putin, what were Putin's comments on the grain deal? Uh, AK, I saw that they extended it 60 days, but I didn't see his actual comments. Yeah. What was the, what were the, what were the actual comments? We're still talking, Sid. We're actually, I went long on the news. So we're going to, we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to take questions for a while longer because I went long on the news today. Um, so I'm waiting to see if, if AK can weigh in really quick on what the, uh, and what Putin's comments were on the grain deal. All right, I'm going to keep looking around. If any, if it pops up and I miss it, mods, try to grab it and pin it. And oh, here we go. Um, said he would honor it for a few months. That was it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what they're after. I mean, the Russians claim the grain deal very simply is Ukraine exports. Ukraine and Russia both have a lot of grain. They're like two of the biggest, if not the two biggest, producers in the world. Russia doesn't want Ukraine to export its grain because a, it's money for Ukraine. B if grain starts getting cut off around the world, people start starving and governments around the world say, we can't afford to have this war go on any longer because people are starving. It's just like the nukes. Putin wants to do whatever he can to scare governments around the world into thinking this war is too dangerous. It can't go on anymore, right? So that's why Putin's doing it. Um, he, 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 he so you, United Nations, Turkey, Russia, and Ukraine reached an agreement last July or so to let Ukraine continue to export. Russia claims that now the agreement isn't fair because even though Russia is allowed to export its, its fertilizer and grain and stuff, Russian fertilizer in particular can't export very easily because all of the international sanctions on banking and everything else make it hard for the Russian fertilizer industry to export fertilizer. Anyway, they're trying to make all of these arguments saying it's not fair, we're not going to let the Ukrainian grain go unless you start lessening the sanctions on us. Well, this is a Russian ploy to get us to, to, to lift some of the sanctions. And so far, Ukraine and the rest of the world's going, uh-uh. Um, one interesting thing that happened the last time Russia did this, because you know the agreement has to keep being renewed. The last time Russia was like, we're not going to renew it anymore, which I think was in November. Russia sort of hinted and said, you know, we can't, we can't guarantee the protection of these ships. And I think it was Turkey, the Turkey, the UN and Ukraine went ahead and they still let ships go. They basically called Russia's bluff and Russia didn't attack the ships, which is interesting. So very interesting. <laughs> Thank you, John Kingdom. I Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I, you know, the, I don't have the latest on the grain. Good question from Rob Wall. And if everybody knows what effect will the wall have on the, uh, will the war have on the upcoming grain growing season in Ukraine? This will impact next winter and following winters. Yeah. I don't know. I like a couple months ago, there were articles about the Ukrainians planting their grain. Um, 
And I want to say there was even a recent article about them like fields that had mines, but part of it was cleared. So they're planting the grain next to the mined part of the field, like crazy stuff. But I don't know what the estimate is for the potential and what it would do to the grain market. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, actually, excellent point by Alexander, uh, Ukrainian on YouTube, by, by basically starving Africa. Um, and the Middle East, right? By cutting off the grain shipments. Thank you. That's got to be flower lady. I assume that was you. Thank you for the mirror bloom. By cutting off Ukrainian exports to Africa and the Middle East, you help exacerbate famine and you basically starve people to death. So what do they do? They can't stay at home anymore because they can't eat. They get up and leave and try to migrate to Europe on boats. Putin or, or by land into Turkey, which again causes problems for a NATO ally. And then Turkey tries to throw them into Greece, which causes problems. So they're, Putin is doing this to also use, he's using the humans as um, little bombs, basically. He's, he's willing to basically starve people to death in order to cause a migration crisis as well. Yeah, no, I forgot about that. That's a good, really good point. It's, it's, it's sick. I mean, it's sick. I wouldn't be scared. Nah. Again, we're, this war has been going on for a year. If anything, what we've learned over the last year is that that all our fears were a little overblown, right? Putin Putin was trying to scare everybody. And in the end, you know, I mean, he's done a lot of damage to Ukraine. I mean, the fears about the international order and all of that, please, right? He hasn't done anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cute, brave Cobra. Um, let me pull up another... Pull up another. Uh... Uh, depends what you mean by that. But Verna's saying, why don't people? Oh, I see. Verna's talking about the discussion about um, about foreign aid to Ukraine and the money for the banks. Why don't people understand that the budget for foreign affairs and defense is not the same as the budget for domestic affairs? Um, correct. Now, what she's talking about is this argument that you know. A lot of the MAGA types, especially. Actually, the far left is doing this too. The far left and the MAGA are both saying this. We should be spending money on America, not on Ukraine. And and they're trying to bring up examples like, you know, the Ukraine thing, this the the banks getting in trouble this weekend. We should be we should be spending it on helping our banks, not on helping Ukraine. And or the far left is putting it as um, we should be helping the poor, not helping Ukraine. And they're presenting it as though like the money would actually go there, right? Like if we didn't help Ukraine, were there, I mean, name me the program for the poor that would be funded if we didn't help Ukraine. There isn't one. We didn't defund any. If anything, if anything, the more, I would say the fair point, the fair criticism to make is helping Ukraine increases our deficit. Yes, that is true. I think it's worth it for a lot of reasons, but that would be at least a valid argument, right? To say it increases the deficit, but it doesn't cut other programs because literally it's deficit spending. We're spending money we don't have and we're spending a lot of money. Every year we spend a lot of money we don't have. That's a fair criticism, but it's not like, oh, we decide to give money to Ukraine and then we say, oh, we're not, we're not funding the poor anymore or we're giving money to Ukraine and now we're not gonna have border security. That's not happening. It's not happening because basically, we're not having, our budget just doesn't work that way. Um, and finally too, I always say too, do you really think, I mean, you know, the, the, as far as like funding the poor, the Republicans aren't going to let you fund the poor. I mean, they're not going to say, hey, let's take the Ukraine money and, and spend it on, you know, and Democrats aren't going to let you build the wall. So, you know, um, it's, oh, Andy, I don't even want to get into the debt ceiling only because that's too, it's sort of too off topic and like, you know, a really big topic too. I think at a future date, we ought to talk about it as a, as a news item. You know what I mean? But not tonight. Um, sorry. Oop. One F. Fakopoulos? 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 Oh, boy. I'm not going to try to pronounce your name on Twitch, but he had an interesting comment here, or she. This is a war of attrition now. Now, a war of attrition kind of means basically each side is just slowly killing the other or quickly killing the other. Right. Alan Tracy, I think you were trying to put up an info. Oh, info. In focalypse. Oh, in focalypse. There we go. I got it now. Thank you. I'm being, I'm being, that was, that was very boomer of me not to figure that out. In focalypse. Okay. Now I like it. It works. Yes. Um, the, 
uh, anyway, this is a war of attrition. So war of attrition is when both sides just are slowly killing it or quickly killing each other and both are just going down, 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 you know, losing their men. This is a war of attrition now. Ukraine used in one year the U.S. production of air defense ammunition of 13 years, and the West has not upped its production. It is far from clear that the war can be won this way. No, that's a valid point. There are concerns about the ongoing um, about the ongoing uh, uh, ammunition for Ukraine. Yeah, in artillery especially. Um, now, I will say Russia's having problems too, which is good. You know, Russia's been having... Um, oh, funny... <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Um, you know, Russia's been having problems too with ammunition, which is good. But, you know, I, one thing that was interesting today, I forgot where I read it. Uh, I know what it was, the defense budget. The I don't know if it's Biden proposing or the Defense Department requesting or I forget what, but basically a budget of like $835 billion or something like that. It's a lot that the defense, is ask, the defense department's asking for. And part of the reason is because they need more money because of all the deficiencies the war in Ukraine pointed out. Because we are now seeing that we don't have the ammunition we thought we had, right? I mean, think about this. Think about if we, the, I mean, if in a way Russia was stupid, Russia almost should have tried to invade Europe if they really wanted to go crazy. We don't have the ammunition to keep fighting this war necessarily if this was all of us against Russia. Now, having said that, we would have had fighter jets we could have used. We would have had cruise missiles. We'd have a lot of other stuff we could use. But nonetheless, in terms of the ammunition we're giving Ukraine, you know, we, we, we learned that we didn't have as much as we thought we did. So we're trying to spend more on that. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I mean, it's a concern. Sure. I, I, would, I would say that's why I would prefer that we had given Ukraine a lot of the weapons up front. Because that's a whole other reason why dragging the war out and slowly, slowly giving Ukraine better weapons. Um, oh, thank you for the sunglasses, Elijah. Slowly, slowly giving better weapons helps Putin. Because not only do Americans get tired of the war and start to say, oh, we've given too much money. Um, but the, uh, well, that, that's the first big thing. So, you know, the Russians can outlast us. But the, oops, I'm trying to remember what we were. Rah! You know, it's funny. I'm like, I'm reading... I do this sometimes too, because there's so many comments going by. I try to sort of keep an eye on your guys' comments as I'm talking. And sometimes I read the comment and then my mind goes out the window. So I can't even remember now what I was saying. Hey, we, we'll do more questions. That's funny. Um, thank you, Alan. Yes, Alan is saying he, he forgot about the time change. I know. I told you guys. Probably a lot of people didn't realize. Um, uh, let me see here. What else we got? What else we got? But thank you for that, Alan. I appreciate that. Um, not yet. PB and J is asking if I'm getting battle fatigue from all the reading and researching I do every day on this. You know, the one thing that can be difficult with any kind of, I guess I would, I would call this, it's funny. I would call this politics, but it's not quite politics what I'm doing with you, but I call it politics in the way that I think I'm providing a service, a uh, raggedy man, rusty. If you meant that to be a question, feel free just to write your question. And we'll we'll put it. Otherwise, thank you. But I think you meant that as a question. Um, you know, to me, this is politics in the sense that I have a goal here. I'm trying to report on the war, but I'm also trying to uh, I'm also trying to uh, uh, achieve something. Right? I want to help Ukraine by reporting on the war. I want to help Ukraine by getting the truth out there, by educating people, by getting people rallied up. Also, raising money. Right? We've been raising money for over eighty thousand dollars that we've raised for Ukraine. So, so I look at it as being almost political in a sense. What I do, but it can be very depressing because when you work on issues that are very negative, every day you're getting angry and you're dealing with negative stuff, and it can be hard. I mean, I think doing this with you guys, even though it, I think it gets tiring doing a show every night. It's nice because this part is fun, right? So this part I enjoy. Like it's the back and forth is interesting. I actually get to, you know, it, you're, I'm communicating with people rather than just reading nasty stories all day. But it, it's a problem in politics overall when you work on issues that matter. Um, you can get, you can almost get depressed or burned out because again, somebody working on poverty issues, you're always dealing with poverty, you know, after a while, or in this case, war, you're always dealing with war. Um, but I will say this too. It's, and it's something I've raised before. Um, and I'm trying to see if uh, if he'd gotten that question. 
Uh, we're, uh, you know, trying to take care of my mental health because it's, uh, um, what we're saying, I raised this before with, um, I'm trying to remember what else I was going to say with this. Um, people getting burned out. I don't remember what I was going to say. Okay. Don't remember, but yeah, it's a, it can be an issue with getting burned out for sure. I'm not feeling it, but it can be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, raggedy man, rusty. Oh, here we go. Moldova could be the first domino in a new Russian plan for horizontal escalation. Do you think this will help Ukraine? I hear uh, Russia does not have the troops for another front. Is this a huge opportunity for Ukraine? I mean, so what's going on with Moldova is Moldova more or less. Okay, more or less. I may not get this perfect, but more or less Moldova's here. Okay. And then there's this quote unquote breakaway region, Transnistria, that the Russians have been breaking away, trying to break away from Moldova. But Moldova more or less is a country in Europe here. Um, they had a very good entry to the Eurovision Song Contest last year, I will say, that I won a song that I love. Um, the Russians have been playing games, have been playing games. The most recent game they've been playing is they paid a lot of people to protest the government. There's a pro-Russian party in, in Moldova, and they paid a lot of people to protest against the government and to basically try to have sort of an insurrection against the government to get people to rise up and overthrow the government. Uh, the government is pro-Western, and the idea is to overthrow the government and put a pro-Russian government in its place. Um, they The government came out and said in the last few days, they arrested a number of Wagner group people who tried to cross the border or maybe did cross the border, but they found them, sent them back to Russia. They, uh, they found a scheme where they were paying people to protest and to basically have the protest turn violent in Chisinau or whatever, which is the capital there in Moldova. So the Russians have been playing games. Um, part of it is they think just the Ru Russia just trying to cause problems. That, that thing, and, and one of the things I read today was it's potentially an indication of how bad the war is going in Ukraine for Russia, that they're trying to stir trouble in Moldo Moldova because it's a typical Russian tactic when things aren't going well, they try to cause trouble elsewhere. So basically, Moldova, mind you, part of the reason why causing trouble in Moldova helps Russia in a general sense is it causes problems for NATO, okay? Moldova's here more or less. Next to Moldova, you've got Romania. NATO ally, European Union. You've got Slovakia, Hungary, NATO allies, European Union, right? So you've got all of these countries nearby that are Europe and NATO. And if the government gets overthrown, if a pro-Russian government gets in its place, if it's unstable, it just causes more of a headache for NATO and more of a headache for the European Union. And now we've got to start worrying about it. And they're just, they're just trying to, yeah, they're trying to stir trouble. I don't know I, I don't see any of that helping Ukraine per se, because the government is pro-Ukrainian right now and pro uh, pro pro Western. Um, I just don't know how much it's going to affect the war if Putin's able to overthrow the government. You know, I think we should do what we can to stop him from doing it, but I don't know that it's gonna that it's gonna change the war per se. I don't think so. Um, so let me scroll down. Okay, I think I've got Ra yep, I've got Raggedy Man Rusty. I already got him. Um, oh, that's funny. Andy is saying that uh, I saw a clip today that people in Transnistria, which is that region that Russia has been trying to break away from Moldova that borders Ukraine, people in Transnistria believe they are screwed because of how bad Russia is doing in the war. I mean, their government is like a Stalinist government or something, basically. I read that they're like the last, they're one of the last Soviet type governments, but you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, what else we got? Hi, Dakota guy. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Oops. I don't know what that is, though. Mordu was mentioning Vilka. Vilka, da, Vilka dash M is the weapon Ukraine is using to hit far behind Russian lines. I'm not familiar with it. Does anybody, um, is anybody familiar with this weapon? Vilka, V-I-L-K-H-A or Vilka? V, v I L V is in Victor I L K H A dash M, but is saying that that's I don't know how it translates to. Whoa, okay, somebody went nuts with the dragon. Ooh, we've got a cool dragon on TikTok. Ooh, who did the dragon? Big drama. Thank you. Oh, that dragon. We love the dragon. <laughs> and 
crazy generous of you. Thank you so much for that. But also, it's really cool. <laughs> it's just really cool. Um, yeah, that dragon is, thank you so much for that. <laughs> that, was, that was neat. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the help as well, personally, but it also makes things fun for the audience, which is great. That's a very cool gift. Um, so yeah, Vilka, they're saying means fork. So fork dash M. I don't know if anybody knows what the exact weapon system is. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I just don't know. Oop. Vilka or Vilka. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, okay, Alex Alexander from Ukraine is saying Vilka M is only 100 kilometers, which means 60 miles. So it still isn't far enough. It still isn't far enough. Let me um let me look on my map here just for fun, and to get a a, a guess of the distance from the Ukrainian front to the Kerch Bridge. Okay, so more or less. Um, yeah, okay, it's more or less to here. Let's see. Oh, 50 miles. Wow. So 50. Sorry, real quick here. Let's do it. Hold on. 50. Yeah, 50. Oh boy. I mean, I'd say a good a good 200 miles I think is the distance potentially. Correct me if I'm wrong, anybody who can do a better look at their phone, but I think you're talking about 200 miles distance between let me show you on the map, between the Ukrainian front up here and the bridge down here is 200 miles from here to here a good 200 miles. They they don't have anything we've given them that can go that far. That's for sure. That's for sure. Um, Vilka, yeah. So who knows, but that's, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so there you go. So Vilka, 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 yeah, okay, yeah. Um, I don't know, I still, because the Ukrainians have hit, now mind you, what's interesting is, Oh, I see. So uh, Mike is saying that the Vilka can go 130 kilometers, which I'm going to guess is 75 miles, maybe. Hey, Google, how many miles is 130 kilometers? kilometers 80. Okay, 80 miles, 80 miles. That's better, but we're talking 200 miles. This thing's got to go, you know? That's a lot. That's a lot, um, unfortunately. I don't know how Greece is doing financially. I don't know. I don't know. I thought the economy had been turned around a lot. I thought I read recently things things were turning around, but I don't know much about it. I haven't been following. I should. Being bad, I'm being a bad Greek. Um, I know, Sasha. Relax. I know. It always sets your guys' Google off when I do that. Sorry. <laughs> I like asking Google stuff. It's useful. Well, do you think this war will ever end? Eventually, yeah, but God knows how long. Um, I mean... Um, we were, you know, America was in Iraq and Afghanistan for almost 20 years. Russia, hey, quiet. The Soviet Union was in Afghanistan for 10 years. Um, doesn't mean the war has to go on that long, but wars can go on a long time. You know, they can go on a long time. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I still think, I still think if we would stop being so chicken, and give Ukraine the weapons it needs, Ukraine could end this, you know? But we're afraid Russia's going to freak out. And at this point, I think we need to stop worrying that Russia's going to freak out. Thank you, big drama for the llama. Big drama llama. <laughs> um, forecast of U.S.-Chinese relations? Not great. Not great. I mean, everyone is predicting a, a battle over, over uh, Taiwan in the next several years. I mean, not everybody, but there's a lot of concern about the U.S. And, and China going to war over the next, you know, possibly the next four. If 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 they invade Taiwan, I mean, Biden has said outright he'll send U.S. troops. Biden said it outright. Um, the U.S. position, even though the U.S. position has been this, you know, strategic ambiguity where we don't say for sure if we go to war, I would say the consent, other than Trump, you can't figure out what Trump would do, somebody like Trump. But I think the general consensus, I've always believed, thank you, Patty Cakes, for the, for the llama, I've always believed the U.S. position to be that basically we'd go to war if the Chinese invaded Taiwan. That, that's the way I always, as an American, how I've always perceived it, even though we don't say it. Biden pretty much came out and said it, and he said it repeatedly, which also shows it wasn't like a mistake. He said it three or four times. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, one hopes that China doesn't go there. Honestly, China, it's kind of like Russia and everything else. Thank you, Mr. Lopez, for the boxing robe. I think with China, they, well, that's the problem. Yeah, the the uh, user you don't know says uh, the TSMC, which is the, what is it? Uh, it's the it's the semiconductor chip company, or is it Taiwan Semiconductor? I forget what the name of it, the company is. TSMC, huge Taiwanese semiconductor plant making computer chips. Taiwan, huge. The top something like 90% or 95%, there's some crazy percentage of the top computer chips in the world are made in Taiwan. Russia try and Russian compu uh, Chinese computer chips are terrible. China's been trying to catch up. I saw 60 Minutes, did a, uh, the American broadcast, did a wonderful show about this now maybe a year ago almost, uh, or last summer, but showing how um, China's been trying to catch up, but they're doing a very bad job. So Chinese computer chips are not good. Um, that right there is one reason why the U.S. cannot let China get Taiwan. There's no way, because then they would control the computer chips that we've got. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Thank you, Solak. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's all dependent on how much China feels uh, that it would be in trouble if it invaded, you know, because China's going to do the, the, the balancing after. You know, I think that's exactly what would happen if China lands in Taiwan will blow it up before giving it up. I think that's exactly true. I think we would destroy those plant, those companies. We would bomb those companies into smithereens before we would give them to the Chinese. I think that's, I think that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, no, in any case, yeah, it would be bad, but China clearly is like gearing up for it. But the only thing that's going to stop war is for China to be convinced that there would be war. That's sort of my, that's my, uh, YouTube has a very good video on the Taiwan chip manufacturing. Okay. People can check it out. But yeah, let's get 60, 60 minutes. You can probably Google 60 minutes probably has it too. Um, Leanne, Leanne is over on YouTube now. It's different on YouTube. She normally she's on TikTok. <laughs> it's different on, yes, it's a different, it's a different, uh, it's a little quieter on YouTube. The TikTok is, Wah! you know, we've got a lot of, a lot of busyness on TikTok. Um, any case, what else? I'll do another question or two and then we can call it quits, guys. I keep meaning to do the Discord, but like we keep going so long, but it's been, you know, there's been a lot of stuff to talk about. Hang on here. Do, 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 do. Let me look. Can Taiwan, well, there's another question too. Can Taiwan and Ukraine overlap? That's a very good question. I don't know. I don't know. Right. Do we have enough to fight both wars? You know, if you're, if you're Russia, and if you're Russia, if you're China, you might think, hey, this is a great opportunity. You know, go after Taiwan now when the West is worried about Ukraine. The only problem is there would be a massive economic boycott of China if they invade Taiwan. Ma I mean, China's already going to be in trouble if it gives weapons to Russia uh, with, with an economic problems. But there's going to be a massive boycott. If China invades, it's going to be just like with web with Russia. And China can't afford to have its economy shut down in essence, or it's, it's you know, international trade cut off to the degree that, cause also the crap we buy from China. I mean, a lot of the stuff from China is just lots of garbage. I mean, meaning everything's made in China. You know, I was looking to buy a plastic two cup measuring cup. They're all made on Amazon. They're all made in China. You know what? I'd survive if I couldn't buy a two cup plastic measuring cup, but they're all made in China. But the point is if you embargo that, it's not going to take any, it's not going to, right? It's not like China's making all my medicine or something. It's not like China's providing my oil, which Russia does, right? Russia provides oil. That's a big deal. But um, yeah, no, I think I think China could be in a lot of trouble economically if they, hopefully, if they were to pull anything. Um, well, I don't know. Could they? That's funny. Why doesn't, that's an interesting question from John S. Why doesn't Taiwan move its industry technology to the U.S.? Isn't that what China, is this what China wants? The only thing is, I don't know if you can, you know what I mean? Like, I don't quite know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, first of all, there's issues in terms of taxes. There's issues in terms of employment. Like, are they big employers in Taiwan? So if they move out of Taiwan, Taiwan loses the jobs, for example. Also, if you're Taiwan, by the way, if the U.S. would probably love, okay, Don is saying TSMC is building two plants in the U.S. If you're Taiwan, you do not want to move your plants out of Taiwan. 
those plants are the only things stopping, uh, not stop, but those plants might be, those plants are why China wants to invade and those plants are why China may not invade because China knows the U.S. will absolutely go to war if it's a matter of stopping if it's a matter of stopping the Chinese from getting uh, the, the, the the semiconductor plants. But if you move the semiconductor plants out of Taiwan, all of a sudden Taiwan became a little less important, right? And now there's at least one less reason to for, in, for the U.S. going to war to defend Taiwan if you move the semiconductors to the U.S. So the U.S. would love them to be used to the U.S. But if you're, but if you're Taiwan, you're kind of like, hey, Maybe it's better for us as Taiwanese to hold something that America considers dear to them to keep it in our country so America wants to defend our country, right? Anyway, so if I so what Taiwan's doing is smart. Build build more plants in the US just in case. Build more plants in the US so there's more ties with the US, but keep your main plants in Taiwan so that the US has a reason to want to defend Taiwan. That'd be my that'd be my thing. Um can U.S. invade Belarus? I mean, we could. Belarus has got to deal with Russia and all of that. I don't think I don't think there's any real benefit though in bombing or attacking Belarus. Is the thing, you know? Um, interesting. Copies is saying that uh, <clears throat> a lot of companies are already pulling out from China in the last few years. COVID, COVID just sped it up and showed how bad the co uh, connection is. So it could hurt us a little less. Interesting. Oh, I see what you're saying. He's saying companies may have fewer contacts with China or fewer connections with economic connections with the Chinese because of COVID. Interesting. Um, they will only be making their most advanced chips in Taiwan, Alan is saying. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. They're two nanometer chips. They won't be making them in the U.S. Okay. But again, that gives you another reason why, um, why the U.S. would, why the U.S. would want to defend Taiwan because we certainly don't want Russia, uh, chi excuse me, China getting the best chips. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, let me do a, a recap. All right. And then, um, oop. Deb, that went totally over my head. Sorry. Deb is saying, want the real scoop. ASML company is 90% of the market share for manufacturing wafers. Oh, you mean for manufacturing the wafers that are used as the computer chips? Is that what you mean? I'm assuming. All right, let me do a recap then. I know none of this sounds good. This is true. It's you know, This is why Taiwan matters. I mean, it's a big deal. Yeah. All right, let me do the recap of the news and then we will call it quits. And then my dog is begging me to brush her teeth because she hates me brushing her teeth, but she likes the toothpaste that tastes like peanut butter. So she's over there now. All right. Um, Former intelligence officer Philip Ingraman told Sky News that the Russians have lost 20 to 30,000 men, 20 to 30,000 men who have died fighting just for Russia to try to win the town of Bakhmut, which is not yet won. Um, Institute for the Study of War reiterated that the Kremlin is likely using the battle in Bakhmut to destroy the Wagner mercenary group. Um, New York Times reports that the International Criminal Court is going to open two war crimes cases against Russia regarding the kidnapping of Ukrainian children and taking them to Russia and Russia's attack on civilians. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is expected to ask a pretrial judge to, appri to approve issuing warrants against several Russians for the abduction of children. Reuters says that the uh, Chinese President Xi is going to be going to Russia for a meeting with Putin possibly as early as next week. And Xi will reportedly then have a video call with Zelensky after that. Uh, Academy Awards, Navalny, the documentary about the Russian opposition leader who is in solitary confinement in Russia, won the Oscar for Best Feature Documentary. Um, and then I read a quote from a political article that was claiming there's a fissure between Ukraine and America. I'm not convinced, but that was quoting a top Republican congressman saying that it feels like Biden doesn't have a clear plan for this war and is kind of trying to drag it out. And I agree. Um, British Ministry of Defense then talked a little bit about Wagner mercenary group recruiting high school kids and that this is more evidence of the trouble they're in that they don't have enough men. Uh, the grain deal, Russia reportedly is going to approve a 60 day extension of the brain deal, but that's it for now. Um, Iran has agreed to buy Su-35 fighter jets from Russia in an expansion of their relationship, obviously con concerning to the West, but also really concerning to you, to uh, Israel. Um, and then I concluded with a story that Zelensky 
has posthumously conferred the highest national title, the hero of Ukraine, and the soldier captured on film smoking his cigarette and saying glory to Ukraine before the Russians gunned him down. Uh, his name was Alexander Matsyevsky. All right, guys. Um, as always, we keep doing these hour and a half shows that I don't mean to be hour and a half shows, yet they are. Um, join me again tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern Time U.S. Remember, as we said, the clocks were set ahead. So now it is 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time U.S. So New York City, Washington, D.C. time is 7.30 p.m. So be aware of that for Europe, at least the time and maybe Latin America, I mean, uh, 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 Asia as well, Africa, if anybody's out there, the time got a little shorter or, what, or whatever it did. So just keep an eye on that as far as joining us again. But yeah, Alexander from Ukraine, thank you for joining us or Ukrainian Alexander. Maybe you're not in Ukraine. Actually, are you in Ukraine? Just curious. Or are you, are you abroad? Just curious. Otherwise, thank you for joining us, guys. Thank you for the mod. Thank a big, big thanks for the moderators for dealing with the trolls as always. Oh, you are in Ukraine. Okay, good, good. To, glad you joined us. Um, thank you for all the gifts, the butterflies, Girth Burger, um, and um, I will Dubai. Ugh. I will uh, see you guys tomorrow night. Okay. So what is tomorrow? Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. Tuesday, six p.m. Eastern Time, U.S. And we will continue the show then. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. And one of these days we will go back to, I mean, I check in with Discord, but one of these days we'll go back to doing a live Discord, a Discord hangout when it's not late at night. I just don't want to screw my voice over. All right. See you guys.